it's time now for us to turn our attention to the word of our God. So, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and I want to read verse 16 again, and then I'll pray. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of our God. And and now I do want to pray and ask him to help us as we look together at it. Father, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the power of your word, the power of your name, your desire, Lord, to, to dwell among your people and to make your presence known among your people. Father, I pray that you would make your presence known now in the opening of your word to us. Father, you know my limitations, my weaknesses. But Father, I pray that today here in this place, in the proclamation of your word, that in my weakness, Lord, your grace would be demonstrated to be sufficient. Father, for all of us, I pray that you would, Lord, tenderize our hearts, till up the soil of our hearts, Make our hearts good ground for the seed of your word today. I pray for the glory of your name. In the precious name of your son, Jesus, we say amen. Without a doubt, John 3.16 is the most well-known verse in the Bible, and for good reason. It, it is, in a nutshell, the gospel. And yet, I fear Few people are really blown away by this verse because we tend to lift it up out of its context and not really get the true depth of what is being said here. So today I want us together to uncover the context of this verse and and here's what I am praying for. If you're already a believer, I am praying that God will set your heart on fire anew by the magnitude of God's love for you. And if you happen to be here yet, uh, if you happen to be here and you're not a believer yet, I'm so glad you're here. We are so thankful that you are here. Our prayer is that the God of the universe, the God who created you, would work powerfully in your life today for your good. So, as we, as we dive into this verse, I just want to remind you that Jesus has been speaking in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, who was a, a, a leader among the Pharisees. Um, he came to Jesus under the cover of darkness. By the world's standards, uh, Nicodemus was a very good man who did good things. And yet, Jesus' message to Nicodemus was that his goodness was not enough. By the way, Jesus' message to Nicodemus would be the same message he would give you and I today. No matter how good we are, no matter how bad we are, we all, before grace has come into our lives, need to be born again. And, And why is the new birth so important? Nicodemus spiritually speaking, was dead in his sins. And you remember what Jesus told Nicodemus at the end of their, their, account, uh, their encounter. There was something that Nicodemus needed to see, right? right? You can't see or enter the kingdom until you're born again, and, and Nicodemus needed to see something. Namely, he needed to see Jesus high and lifted up in the same way that under Moses, the Israelites saw the serpent lifted up on the pole And because they went out, they they trusted and obeyed. And those who went and looked out and saw that brazen serpent high up on a pole, they were saved. Nicodemus needed to see Jesus high and lifted up one day on the cross, dying for the sins of Nicodemus. Nicodemus needed spiritual eyes to see his own sin and that the only remedy for that was Christ, the Son of Man, and his sacrifice that he would make. Nicodemus needed to shift the weight of his trust away from trusting in his own good works to trusting 
in the work and the sacrifice of Jesus for his standing with God. So as we look at John 3.16 and really this whole context that Cameron read for us, there are three things that we want to notice. Number one, and y'all, it's very simple. God's love, God's gift, and God's terms. His love, his gift, and his terms. Number one, God's love. Right? In verse, in verse 16, we're told that God so loved the world. Now, and, and, uh, y'all don't know how I've been wrestling with this text all week. If, if I was only going to just pick this phrase, we, there's so much here to bring out of it. But look at the contrast. God so loved the world. God is holy and the world is not. First John 5, 19 says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In John 3, 16, we're told, that, we're told about God's love for the world, and yet in John 15, verse 18, Jesus taught that the world hates him and his people. The thing that makes all of this so surprising and I think makes it so critical for us to see is that the, God's reason for loving the world is not because the world is so lovable. I'm gonna tell you something, and I re- like I realize what I'm about to say is completely devastating to the modern concept of self-esteem. And yet, I believe if you can grasp what I'm about to say, this will be the most healing comforting um, principle you could have in your life for your mental, spiritual health. God's love for you is not motivated by some goodness in you. It's not the qualities in you that made you special to God. What made you special to God, what moved him toward you were the loving qualities in himself. If you were to go to the book of Romans chapter five and you read verses six through 10, you would see that we were described, like all humanity is described there as being weak, ungodly, sinful, and the enemies of God. Like that's everybody, right? But in spite of all of those things that are true about us, Romans five, eight says that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We ought to be jumping up and shouting that the good news of the gospel is not we gotta somehow get ourselves cleaned up or get ourselves to some level of righteousness or sanctity and then God will love us, then God will accept us. Why is this superior to God loving you because of qualities in you. You know, something we see all the time in human relationships, men and women fall in love with each other. And you know, you typically, um, I've said this before, I didn't fall in love with my wife. I I didn't, (laughs) when I fell in love with Carrie, it was definitely because of qualities in her. She was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. She made me laugh. We, her personality was warm and inviting to me. I, I, I did not look at my wife and say, here is a poor, unfortunate soul, and let me bestow some mercy and grace on her, right? It was qualities in her that drew me to her, right? But you know something you and I have seen in relationships, and some of you may have even experienced this, is people will fall in love because of characteristics the others have, but people change. You know, when you're young, you might be handsome or pretty, but you're gonna get old, probably pick up some weight. You're gonna get some wrinkles. That kind person who is so into you is gonna go, grow up, you know, y'all gonna grow up and you're gonna go through some stuff, man. You're gonna go through some stuff with your spouse that quite frankly, listen, uh, if you're... <laughs> If you're married here and you're a Christian, you're gonna either say amen or ouch, what I'm about to say. If you're hoping to be married one day, you need to take some notes on this because two believers trying their best to serve Christ and love one another will find marriage challenging. 
because they're, they're both sinners still struggling with their own sin. <laughs> now, I'm one flesh with another sinner and we're both struggling, right? That's just the reality of it. But, but people change. Sometimes for, for reasons we don't even understand, but you know, and, and so sometimes, right, someone goes through a hard time in life, someone goes through changes, and people fall out of love with each other. You're not making me happy anymore. So now I'm gonna give up on you. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go find somebody else that can make me happier. Friends, God's love for his people will never change because God's love for us is not rooted in some qualities in us that he finds attractive. His love for us is rooted in his own unchanging faithfulness. So, Christian, you, you're going to have ups and downs in your life. You might lose your job. You might struggle with your faith. You might struggle with sin. You know, you might make mistakes, but God's never going to give up on you or stop loving you. Let me put it this way. Let's take a Christian and let's look at her, this imaginary Christian. <laughs> if this hits home with somebody, I promise I was just making this up in my mind, so I have not been reading your, your text or email, but just imagine this Christian, right? For over the past two weeks, you know, two weeks ago, man, she was on cloud nine. She got up every morning, read her Bible, prayed, did her devotions. That week, she witnessed to three people and one of them even came to church with her that Sunday. And then the next week, wasn't such a great week. She didn't read her Bible at all. She barely prayed, and even when she tried, it felt like God was a million miles away. You ever had, like, two different weeks line up kind of like that? God doesn't love you more on your good weeks and less on your bad weeks. His love for us never changes God's love for his people doesn't change from one week to the next. His love for us certainly does not depend on how well we perceive ourselves to be doing in our Christian walk, and it doesn't depend on how we feel about his love at any given moment. God tells us in Jeremiah 31, verse three, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. You know, there's something I love about the Apostle John. He never ceased to be amazed by the love of God. When he's writing the Gospel of John and when he writes his other letters, everybody's pretty sure like he's writing like really late in the first century. So he is an elderly man now. He's in his 80s, possibly, you know, somewhere thereabouts. So he, for decades, he has been serving Christ through the ups and downs. And I want you to listen to what he said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. I'm reading the older translation here. Behold, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we. What kind of strange love is this? Strange and amazing love is this, that, that a God this holy could love me, such a sinner, and make me his child, that we should be called the sons of God. Y'all know something? Part of my, I, I've been wrestling with this passage all week, and, and part of it is, I'm just gonna confess, I feel so humbled. I feel so inadequate. I want so desperately to be able to, to describe to you the immensity and the grandeur of God's love, and like I'm fully aware, like I'm not even coming close to anything like scratching the surface. But, but I don't think I'm alone. Um, these words that I'm about to read you, um, we are told, were found. It was added to a Christian hymn, but the, the, the author of the hymn, the, these weren't his words. These words were found written on the walls of an insane asylum. Could we with ink the ocean fill 
and were the skies of parchment made, where every tree on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. On one hand, there is no way, like if every tree was a pen and, and, you, and all the oceans were ink and the whole universe was paper where you could just write about and describe the love of God, like the ink would run out, the, tr- the pens would run out, the sky would run out before you could ever adequately put down on paper how great the love of God is. So on one hand, there's no way we can adequately describe the love of God, and yet on the other, God has given us a very powerful way to see and experience his love. Let's look at number two, God's gift. Number one, God's love. Number two, God's gift. The value of God's love can be measured by the value of his gift. Genuine love is never measured by feeling. Like our whole world has completely perverted the meaning, the nature of true love. True love is not about feelings. Genuine love is reflected in the way a person acts towards the person they say they are loved. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved that he gave. And friends, what did God give? God gave us the most precious possession he had. He gave us his son. I, we have to use our imagination a little bit. I realize that, I realize that but, but just try to think about the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, the relationship that they shared uh, from all eternity before there ever even was uh, a creation. John chapter 17, mentioned, in it, Jesus mentions the glory, the joy, and the love that existed between God the Father and God the Son. Proverbs chapter eight speaks about how before creation, God the Father and God the Son were in one another's presence. And, and, and it says that, that the Son was daily the Father's delight and that the Son was rejoicing in the Father. On two separate occasions, God the Father, during the ministry of Jesus, God the Father, contrary to modern thought, God has not done this very often. But on two occasions, God spoke audibly from heaven and said about Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God gave, listen to this, God gave his only son whom he loves. Does that sound familiar? Do you remember the story of Abraham and Isaac? Isaac was the promised child, the child that that Abraham waited 25 years for. Isaac was the son through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. One day, God calls Abraham to do something that was unthinkable, but he did it to test Abraham and, and to give all of us this, this lesson that for thousands of years has helped be a, a wonderful pointer to Jesus. In Genesis chapter 22, verse two, God told Abraham, and I quote, Take your only son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. And God said, take him up to a mountain that I will show him, show you and offer him as a sacrifice. And guys, do you know what Abraham did? He obeyed his God. Abraham gathered wood for an offering, a knife and, a, and fire and took his son, and God led him to the place. And on the, somewhere along the way, Isaac looks up to his dad and says, Dad, I see the wood and I see the fire, but 
where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham says, my son, God will provide for himself the sacrifice. They get to the place where God showed them and they get there. Abraham stretched his son out across that wooden altar. And with his knife raised, ready to stop, God stopped Abraham. You remember how Abraham looks up in the, in, in the bushes? There is a, a ram, which is, um, a ram is a male lamb, but a, a ram, powerful male ram, caught in the bushes by his own horns. And that day, the ram became the substitute for Isaac. The ram was sacrificed, but Isaac was saved. Do you know that there came another day when, when the God of heaven, the Father of glory, led his only son, his only son whom he loved, up a little hill, up a little mountain called Golgotha. And there Jesus was stretched out across a wooden altar that we call the cross. And when the sword of God's justice was raised against Christ, there was no substitute to take his place. Jesus was the substitute who took our place. It should have been us there that day, suffering the wrath of God on the cross. John 3.17 says, God did not send his son into the world to, to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came and took our place. Not, he didn't come and bring condemnation. He came and he suffered the condemnation that we deserve. As Bart prayed, Jesus lived the life that we should have lived and he died the death that we should have died. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says this, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus was the atoning sacrifice, the wrath absorbing, the wrath appeasing sacrifice. He did not come into the world to be condemned. He came into the world to suffer condemnation. So if you are in Christ today, you can say right along with Paul in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. In Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, Paul prays for Christians that we would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I, I, I can't even begin to really uh, understand myself, let alone communicate all that that means, but doesn't that sound wonderful? Like th this prayer that the Holy Spirit would enable us to in some way experience the, the, the length and breadth, the height, the depth, the, to know the love of Christ that surpasses human capabilities of understanding. In the 1800s, Napoleon's armies discovered a dungeon cell that had been used in the Spanish Inquisition. And in this cell, they found the remains, long since um, perished human remains in this cell. And on the wall, on the rock wall, there was, there was scraped in a crude cross. And in Spanish, were the words length, breadth, height, and depth. J. 
John Stott said that the love of Christ is broad enough to encompass all mankind, especially Jews and Gentiles. Broad enough to encompass all mankind, long enough to last for eternity, deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner, and high enough to exalt him to heaven. That's God's love and God's gift. Now let's look number three at God's terms. There's a few things we have to face here. Everything I've been saying is so wonderful. Um, but we have to come to grips with a few things here, don't we? God's love, as grand as it is, does not mean that every single human being will be saved. And it does not mean there are multiple different ways to be saved. The only people who benefit from the saving work of Christ, the only people who will enjoy the rich mercy and grace of God are those who believe in the Son of God. When verse 16 says, God so loved the world, and by world, I think the main point that the Apostle John is trying to get at when he says, God so loved the world, I think what John is trying to say is that God so loved both Jews and Gentiles. You remember, John was a Jew. And he came up, in, a, in, a, in all of Judaism from his perspective was the Messiah would, would be a savior for the Jews, right? Every year on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would go in to make the atonement, who was he going in for? That man was not going in to make intercession or sacrifice for Gentiles. When he went in on his shoulders, were precious stones, and he had a breastplate with 12 stones, and engraved on those stones were the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. He was going in on the behalf of the Jews. And what he's saying is, Jesus was not a savior only for Jews, but also all types of people, Jews and Gentiles. God so loved not just the Jewish people, but all types of people. However, the good news of the gospel is only to those who believe in Christ. I want you to think about this. Can we get real for just a minute? We need to get, even if it's hard, I think we gotta get real with this. When many people die, whether or not they were followers of Christ, whether or not there was any evidence of, at all of any genuine faith, what, what is it when we, we, you hear about almost everybody who dies, well, they're in a better place now. I have some bad news, guys. Everybody who dies does not go to a better place. The good news of the gospel is that those who trust in Jesus do not perish, but have everlasting life. Those who reject Christ receive not everlasting life, but everlasting punishment. Listen to the end of this chapter, John three thirty six. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever, if you're here today and you are not a believer in Christ, I lovingly want to ask you to reckon with this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You'll never get the full weight. You'll never see the full beauty of John 3.16 until you see this. God is love, but he is also holy. God is love, but he is also just. And God cannot pervert justice. He cannot, com he cannot compromise his holiness because of his love. God's wrath has been poured out on all sin. That is what justice requires. But at the end of the day, there are only two kinds of people those who will endure the wrath of God standing in their own sins. And then there are those 
who are standing in Christ. Remember who was the propitiation? He appeased the wrath of God on behalf of his people there on the cross. There are those who have fled from the wrath to come and have run to Christ and have hidden themselves in them. And in all those who are in Christ, the wrath of God has been fully satisfied. It's been fully taken away. There is not a drop, there is not an ounce of wrath or anger of God against those who are in Christ. In Christ, our sins have been taken away from us as far as the east is from the west. And the good news, we've been looking at this really over the last three Sundays, but this morning, if you're here and, um, you know, if you're not in Christ, you need, uh, it's kind of like someone told me recently, you know what they say first, if you're in an airplane and, and, and the cabin loses pressure and the masks drop out, they say, hey, listen, you need to get your own mask on before you try to help somebody else right? Because you're not going to be able to help anybody out, else out if you're passed away. Listen, if you're not in Christ, you need to flee your sins and everything and run to him. But I, I know there's some of us here who are concerned, deep in our souls, burdened with sorrow for those we love and care about who do not know him, who are not following him. His arm is not short that he cannot say, that he cannot reach them. Some people get indignant about the fact that we claim that there is only one way of salvation, and that is through faith in Christ. Friends, we should not be surprised that there is only one way. Uh, R.C. Sproul, in something I read this week, said, we should be surprised that there is even one way, right? That's what we should be surprised about. What does it mean to believe in Christ? What does it mean to believe in the name of the only Son of God? Verse 19 says, this is the judgment or condemnation, and this is really the, the pronouncement over all humanity outside of grace. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. This is the sad reality of the world we live in. And our fallen sinful nature, by nature we prefer sin to Christ. Outside of God's grace, 100 times out of 100, we will choose our selfishness and sin over Jesus, right? We prefer darkness rather than light. If you've ever, um, if you've ever had like a board that was sitting out in your yard for too long, and you lift it up and there's roaches underneath it, what happens when they see the light? They scurry to the darkness. The fact that our sin nature loves darkness rather than light, you know, that doesn't mean, we gotta put this all in perspective, that doesn't mean we're all as horrible as we could possibly be, right? You just prefer being your own Lord. You prefer being your own sovereign. You prefer yourself. You, pre you pre prefer for you to be the one who gets to say what fruits you eat and what fruits you don't eat. We can't, friends, be mistaken about the heinous nature of sin. Sin is like an acorn, right? One little acorn, it seems so small, but in it is the potential for a billion oak trees, all of which, <laughs> each one could produce a billion acorns, each acorn, a whole world. That's, 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 that's essentially what Adam and Eve's sin was. One seemingly so, such a small sin, and yet all of the sin that is all of the brokenness, all of the, all of the every tear, every heartache, every case of cancer, every case of child abuse, 
every case of neglect, every case of theft, murder, rape, all came in through that one little sin. Here's what it means to believe in Christ. When the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to see the sinfulness of the world, and not mainly that, but mainly your own sin, you see your condition outside of Christ. And you see Christ as your only hope, and what he accomplished up at the cross is the only remedy for your sin. So you turn away from your sin your selfishness, we call that repentance. It's more than just confessing. It's not, oh, I'm a sinner, we all fall short. Yada, 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 please forgive me. No, repentance is turning away from a life of sin and turning towards Christ. You begin to rely on him and what he has done for you at the cross. You trust in his life and in his death. And at the very moment a person turns away from their selves and their sins, and they turn to Christ in faith, God the Father looks down from heaven at you and says the same thing he says about his own son. This, to the person who has faith, genuine faith in Christ, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. It's a frightening thing to come out of the darkness into the light. But it's kind of ironic that it's everything that we were afraid, you know, in doing that, everything that we're afraid of actually is going to happen by staying in the darkness. Turning from darkness to the light, turning from sin to Christ. When we come to Christ, what we find? Nothing to fear. No condemnation now I dread, but Christ and all in him is mine. When we come to Christ, it's not condemnation, it's not judgment, it's not a cold shoulder, it's love that we find, it's the Father's embrace, it's eternal life. Father, thank you for your word. And Father, the only thing I can do is depend on your Holy Spirit to do in all of our hearts and minds and lives all the things that I, as a mere man, am not capable to do. But Father, I thank you that while I'm weak, your word is powerful. Your spirit is powerful. Father, I pray that today your gospel would strengthen our faith. Give us a clearer sight of your son, Jesus. Father, if there's even one here who does not know your son, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. And Father, for so many who we love, who we work with, are part of our families, maybe we know at school, Lord, I pray for the salvation of those whom we love. Father, like Paul, Lord, I I pray that our hearts would be more and more broken that our friends and neighbors, our coworkers, don't know you, aren't trusting in your son and aren't following him. And Father, I just pray. Father, this gospel in a nutshell here in John 3, 16, Father, I pray that not only would we here at the road believe it, but that we would live it and that it would radiate radiate out from us and that these truths we would share and that you would use us to reach those who do not know you for the glory of your name. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.